So when people have a drink or two, they feel less inhibited. They also, at least at the early stages of drinking, they tend to feel more confident. I think for women, one of the big surprises is that it doesn't take much ingestion of alcohol to diminish egg quality. In this video featuring Dr. Huberman, he discusses the neurological and behavioral effects of alcohol intoxication. He highlights how alcohol's darkest secrets disrupt neural circuits and they inhibit the prefrontal cortex, affecting our brain's understanding and function. You know, it was probably the drugs and alcohol that I was exposed to. So alcohol made me feel kind of sedated, as it does, as a forebrain inhibitor, as we'd say in neuroscience. And the drugs at the time, people were mostly smoking and taking LSD and mushrooms and none of that really appealed. I mean, I do have a drug and it's adrenaline. I love the, the clarity of mind and the energy that comes from adrenaline. He emphasizes the importance of considering our health even after years of heavy alcohol usage. The renowned neuroscientist also addresses the misconception that low serotonin levels solely cause depression. I think what we should do is is image your brain and Bert's brain. Okay. And what you're going to see, but what you don't want to end up with is the Homer Simpson thing, right? With the little brain inside the big skull. Yeah. And that's essentially what alcohol does over oh time. And then what happens is people end up on repeat of the same five or 10 stories and circuits. You ever been around somebody who's been a long time drinker? Yeah. They just kind of become the old story over and over yeah. again. He explored the reliefs of symptoms through medications that increase serotonin levels, debunking the notion of a single cause for depression. Furthermore, he delves into the impact of alcohol on memory formation, leading to gaps in recollection the next day. This is the same prescriptive that they give alcoholics, heroin addicts, etc. That, but some of those drugs, of course, have actual withdrawal symptoms that can be problematic. Uh, you know, these days, I, I'm not a pot smoker. I've never, I've never liked drugs or alcohol. I kind of lucked out that way. The enlightening video discusses the relationship between alcohol and stress hormones like cortisol. Huberman explains how alcohol can temporarily relax individuals, but actually result in increased cortisol levels during sobriety. Alcohol disrupts the architecture, the quality of your sleep. You can fall asleep, but the sleep you get is not restorative. And the first part of your night when you sleep is really for repair of the body, growth hormone release, etc. The second half is when two things happen. One is you tend to have dreams that are very emotionally laden, but you are paralyzed. You have sleep atonia. Um, you can't move. And it's a kind of trauma therapy. It emphasizes the significance of maintaining a balance of vitamin D3, K2, and electrolytes for overall health and suggests strategies to restore and sustain that balance. So when people have a drink or two, they feel less inhibited. They also, at least at the early stages of drinking, they tend to feel more confident. They tend to continue drinking, then they mm. tend to lose their self-image. They forget who they are. They can even go blackout drunk. Uh -huh. And the downstream chemicals are interesting for a small, maybe 8% of the population. Alcohol causes a huge dopamine increase. These are the people that from the first drink, they discover that they are an alcoholic or very prone to alcoholism. Mm. Genetic predisposition to alcoholism is briefly mentioned by Dr. Huberman, particularly regarding the age at which individuals start drinking and their likelihood of developing alcohol dependence. The video also addresses the impact of alcohol on the gut microbiome, acknowledging its disruptive effects and the potential for the system to self-repair. But the point is that you want to train on your own hormones, get learn good sleep, good nutrition, good habits, and also live your life, right? You're not gonna like not have a beer or two every once in a while at age 22, just cause you might not recover as well. Like, right. okay, if you have a tendency towards alcoholism, be careful, but you know, let, let's live your life is my, my uh, stance. But once you have all those things in place, Let's say you already have kids and people are feeling tired and more sluggish then testosterone replacement therapy can make sense for some people. The problem is a lot of people think if a little is good, more is better. And that's not, and that's not good. And also it's what you do with that. You still have to run, eat well, Yeah. you know, preserve your cardiovascular health. Yeah, it doesn't replace yeah. those yeah, things. Yeah, you still need blood work to make sure your prostate antigens aren't going crazy and stuff like that. Yeah. I hear about young guys who are just like, you know, they're slamming Viagra and testosterone. It's like this and that, that that's not going to, play out very well over time. Right. Like see what you can do naturally with yeah. hard work and dedication and balance. Yeah. And then over time you can explore things. But the peptides are interesting. They're kind of a, you know, 
middle ground where you're not risking as much in terms of long-term fertility issues. Um, they're not going to they're not going to give you a ton of acne or something, or you know make someone look crazy um, like they could if they uh, abuse steroids. And women are using them a lot more now because they're milder. They don't have these so-called androgenic effects. They're not going to deepen the voice. They're not going to create facial hair for women, that kind of thing. But they, yeah, they they certainly work. They're banned in sports for a reason. Dr. Huberman discusses hangovers, including the role of congeners and alcoholic beverages and their contribution to hangover severity. Yeah. I actually didn't set out to tell people that alcohol is bad or or that cannabis can be good or bad. That's how I feel about it, depending on the person in the context, or that nicotine can be good or bad, depending on how it's brought into the body in the context and the age of the person. I'm just trying to give people the knowledge so they can make decisions for themselves. I always say, you know, um, do, what you, do what you want, but know what you're doing. And I think it would be great if you would cut back. He highlights the euphoric effects of alcohol and he underscores the need for personalized approaches to sobriety. Moreover, Dr. Huberman emphasizes that quitting alcohol completely may not be medically safe for everybody, and he suggests following alcohol consumption guidelines. With the sauna, it's the same thing. How hot to make it? Well, don't kill yourself, obviously. Um, be smart. If you're pregnant, you shouldn't be doing this anyway. Um, but it's very clear that what you need is the release of something called dynorphin. We have endorphin, which makes us feel good. It binds to these mu opioid receptors in the body you have dynorphin which is the terrible feeling that you get when you're in really hot temperatures it's also the terrible effect that alcoholics feel when they are in withdrawal you feel agitated you want to get out it's really unpleasant it's dynorphin binding to the so-called kappa opioid receptor is that's what you're trying to trigger when you do that a number of things happen you set off heat shock proteins that go repair broken proteins and misfolded proteins it also makes it so that later endorphin binds its receptor more strongly. So when you have this uncomfortable experience in the heat, you literally feel better in real life when pleasurable events come on, uh, when you experience them. In the same way, I like to say this, that when you get into a cold ice bath or cold shower, the increase in epinephrine and dopamine is two to 300%. These are huge increases and they last many hours. Sperm analysis can be a humbling thing because, you know, no matter what, no one's getting 100% motile, forwardly motile. Everyone, males and females, learn a lot about their biology, what they're doing well, what they're doing less well when going down that pathway of IVF, I think. Yeah. I think for women, one of the big surprises is that it doesn't take much ingestion of alcohol to diminish egg quality. You know, beyond two or three drinks per week, Per week, you really start to see reductions in egg quality that are probably indirect through effects on diminished sleep and changes in stress hormones. And so, you know, again, some people will be more resilient to this than others. People always like to make jokes about how alcohol facilitates the conception process, you know, <laughs> etc. You know, I think that in general, you know, if women are having very regular cycles, whether or not they're 28 days long or 35 days long is less important perhaps than they be fairly regular. So when people have a drink or two, they feel less inhibited. They also, at least at the early stages of drinking, they tend to feel more confident. They tend to continue drinking, then they mm. tend to lose their self-image. They forget who they are. They can even go blackout drunk. Wow. And the downstream chemicals are interesting. For a small, maybe 8% of the population, alcohol causes a huge dopamine increase. These are the people that from the first drink, they discover that they are an alcoholic or very prone to alcoholism. Mm. Uh, I've known people like this, then these are the people that can drink like nobody else. It's not just a tolerance, it's that dopamine system kicking in. Whereas for most people, it's more of a sedative, it works through the so-called GABA system, and it's more of a, just kind of a tranquilizer to, to shut everything got it, down. Got it. Okay. okay. But it, it doesn't help you focus? No. So a lot of people self-medicate by, so being alert is a, is a prerequisite to being focused, but being too alert makes it hard to focus because then your spotlights are going all over the place. Some people use alcohol as a way to reduce that level of alertness slightly and get into kind of a groove mm -hmm. where they can, you know, focus a little better than they would otherwise. The, ideally, you would know how to do that without alcohol, but a lot of people use alcohol for that reason. And, you know, there are some 
and in their 70s who maintain testosterone levels of similar to men in their 20s and 30s. Highly individual, depends a ton on how much people are moving, how much sunlight they're getting, how little alcohol and nicotine, smoking nicotine, mm -hmm. not nicotine the substance, but they're bringing into their system exposure to environmental toxins, these kinds of things. And we always think of BPAs and receipts, they are a problem. Handling receipts, not good printed receipts. 